Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying the Cloud, provided to you by Ease Technologies. We are ready to get started. I would like to introduce your host and presenter for today's program, Dave Kyle. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Uh, we'll be running to pretty close to one o'clock. We may get done a little sooner than that, but uh, right now, as indicated on the screen, you should be hearing some audio. If not, you can dial in. And, and most importantly, uh, this is a, uh, an area where you can, in the control panel, ask some questions. So you could you see a question dialog, uh, this little triangle there you can hit and engage with us with some questions that we're having along the way or at the end. So I'd like to uh, welcome Pat Bubeck with me as well. Pat, how are you doing today? Good, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, the, if you are not familiar with our company, we're Ease Technologies, founded in 1993. We are located in Columbia, Maryland. We provide IT managed services and cloud solutions for the Baltimore, Washington region. So let's get started. Uh, our agenda today is uh, discussing some of the traditional kind of setups and arrangements that you might find in an office, getting into our main topic, which is demystifying the cloud and trying to help people understand how they're using it today and some of the objections or concerns they have using cloud services providing and, and identifying some solutions you may be already using, how to use them better, and then trying to share with you some innovative ideas about some new uh, cloud desktop services that are out there. And finally, uh, wrapping things up with a few tips on uh, how to share some files on cloud services more securely. So Pat, um, let's talk a little bit about how we experience and see a lot of traditional firm infrastructure and kind of what happens and, and some concerns or conversations we have a lot of, with a lot of folks. Yeah, the big ones we see are, are limited mobility and access. But what we mean by that is, you know, you're, you're dependent on your office to get in there and work on your machine that you have in your office. Uh, you have to use a certain type of uh, device in your office, if it's Mac, if it's PC. Uh, people can't really choose, pick and choose. You have to go with what everyone else has in your office. Um, it's very hard to scale this when you have new employees, you have to buy new hardware. Things like that are, are very common. Yeah, so one of the things that we ran into and we talked to a lot of accounting firms is that they're really tied to the office. So in, in a conversation I had with a firm last year where they have about uh, 20 employees, because of the servers, the way things were arranged, they didn't have VPN, which is a, a way to connect into the office remotely and securely. During snow events, for example, um, employees were, were unable to work from home or anywhere else and a lot of, lost a lot of days during last winter. And I know we're experiencing some of that now and uh, want to discuss how cloud services can help overcome some of that. So what are some of the business needs we see today, Pat? What are the things that we're trying to solve for organizations? We, we, we just try to make it easier for people to use what they're comfortable with, uh, whether it's a PC, a Mac. Uh, some people like to work off their iPad at home. Uh, we try and make those, uh, those possibilities you know, come true for them. I think the biggest one that we we try to work towards is, is the mobile and remote users. Um, again, there's a lot of folks that are trying to take advantage of either, in some cases, working remotely on vacation, um, whether they're having a weather situation, they need to be able to work from home, someone's got some family needs, they need to stay at home, or they're, or they're just trying to be working in someone's account and they need to get the access to their data. So there's a lot of mobile and remote users. Um, the other thing that we really try to emphasize and, and help organizations is disaster recovery. Of course, we've been working on providing backups for organizations, but disaster recovery is more than just backups. And we try to provide um, resources and information uh, and services that help them provide quicker backups is what it comes down to for a, what a problem that they have. And I guess um, security and scalability is important too. What, what kind of things are you running into, Pat, when you talk about security with organizations? We get questions all the time. What kind of antivirus should I be using? Um, are there, is there anything else I should be doing besides changing my password uh, every now and then? There's a lot of different things out there, and there's a lot of different ways you can really make your stuff more secure and, and harder to to access with, without having a, a, perhaps a second form of authentication, maybe accessing from your phone, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we've been continuing to look at that and scale and organizations up and down. A lot of uh, accounting organizations, of course, this time of year have added resources and, and people to their system, um, having to add more computers, more licensing, things like that, and then reducing costs, of course, is always important in any business, and we always were very sensitive to doing that. So again, looking at cloud services, how can cloud services help businesses with some of these issues? 
So in, in discussing cloud services with, with organizations, we hear a lot of the same things. One of the first questions and, and issues that people bring up is, you know, how secure is it? Um, I have a lot of security concerns. Can I do that? Is it going to be expensive for me? You know, am I going to have to spend more money on my existing platform to make it compatible for what I do? And one of the big ones out there is, I often hear, is it's not a proven technology. It's kind of new and gimmicky. And it's not going to be really be around. And Pat, that's actually the one I, I kind of, um, I think, not humored about, but interested most about in answering for folks is it's not a proven technology. Um, just sharing with everybody, kind of having been in the industry for a little while now, that Cloud is actually an older concept. Uh, if anyone's familiar with CompuServe, America Online, Prodigy, these are actually cloud-like services. The only difference being that they were dial-up services that we used many years ago. Essentially, we had mainframe or other servers out there that we accessed through a dial-up mechanism from our computer. We had access to data. We could have email, uh, forums, all kinds of uh, information news. And that was the main means of getting to that type of information. But it was remote. It was a remote server that you had access to. Today, with the internet, the concept is still much the same. We're now taking servers or taking um, applications and we're putting them into the cloud. So one of the things I like to talk with organizations about is the security aspect of this, but also the disaster recovery. So just putting behind that, you know, cloud is an, a new gimmicky concept. It's actually in essence, an older proven concept. Let's talk about some more of the security and disaster recovery aspects of cloud services and what they provide for us. So Pat, when you're talking to an organization about um, bringing on more cloud services, what are some of the things that you're gonna look at or explore with them? Yeah, as you see here on this slide, you'll see a picture here of a, a server room. This is probably something maybe some of you have in your office right now. It's pretty, uh, pretty common we see something like this and it obviously isn't the best solution for your office. Um, some questions we like to ask a company is, you know, where are your so servers located? Is there a, a door with a lock on it? Does the cleaning crew have access to it? Uh, do employees know the code to get into this office? Um, the other one that we always, you know, stress is, is one of the most important things you can have for your company are backups. Um, more often than not, we ask a, a company owner a couple questions. Where are they, where are they stored? Is it a redundant backup? And most of the time they can't answer these questions. And these are ones you're going to want to know. For instance, if your office, if your server crashes, how long will you be offline? Can you instantly restore off another server? Can you restore off a backup quickly? Those are things you need to know and you need to know quickly. Okay. So, yeah, and actually, I give an example of um, a situation that we saw across the street from us here in Columbia where last winter, it was actually I think it was worse weather-wise than this year, but it was pretty cold and um, came back to find that the building across the street, uh, the sprinkler system on the top floor of the sixth-story building um, froze up and broke some pipes and the water started going through the whole building. So for three weeks after that, uh, many businesses were displaced out of that building where they did cleanup. Um, and that's one of those things about, you know, can your business a recover from something like that. It's not just a fire. Uh, it's not just a security situation. Can it be something as simple as you know a water issue? Which I think in most cases, most insurance companies say water issues are the most common problem out there. And can you recover from something like that? Yeah, I think the point is that you just never really know what's going to happen, I and mean, you have to be prepared in, in the event that something completely random does occur. So let's talk about where, where cloud services or solutions really do help out in a situation like we're talking about or the, even the slide we're showing here. So, Pat, could you explain when we talk about cloud security compliance, what does that mean? You know, we, 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 there may be a service that, and we'll give some examples here shortly, whether it be Dropbox or other organizations that people be familiar with. Why is a cloud you know, environment oftentimes be better for them than what they're doing today? Yeah, the, the cloud environments all are stored in data centers. They are very strict on these compliances. They, they have regulations in place that require uh, some of these uh, listed here. For instance, the building has to be completely secure. You have to have a background check to get in. You can't just walk in in one of these locations. Um, I've actually visited a couple, and it's really impressive the way they, they have things set up where they can run for days in, in the event of a complete uh, power outage. They have generators. Um, it's it's these types of steps that they take to make sure that your data is secure 
uh, it's, it's really something you obviously can't do in your own in your own office. Yeah, it's diff- difficult to replicate some of these things, and you know we even recognize it our, on our, our our own capabilities here in our building, and we use our own data center outside our facilities here because of um, its capabilities to have the security, having the generator backups, things like that that we just can't replicate. Um, and there's also a lot of these uh, cloud um, data centers, essentially what they are. Follow other standards as well. That may be HIPAA, PCI, or other industry standards, which are really important. Yeah, and those can be those can be pretty off, pretty difficult for a small company to um, be compliant in that. It's it's a difficult process. It can get expensive, and it's it's very tricky to follow the regulations in place. And that's where these data centers have the ability to do so very easily. Um, so let's give some examples of some of these cloud-based services. That actually, go beyond just the uh, idea of a a, um, application. So some of them include phone systems, which is voice over IP, which we'll talk about in a moment. File sharing, which is commonly you know known through a number of services out there, and many of you who are involved with uh, accounting uh, firms and practices have many different ways you're sharing files with customers and clients. Applications, something like Quicken Online. Servers, like Office 365. Network services, like a data backup. Um, Pat, you want to talk about an example of how this is with the, the, the backup system? Yeah, there's there's some backup uh, systems out there that give you the ability to do um, more of a more of a comprehensive backup. For instance, your backup is is backed up locally to this device. That device takes your data and moves it off site at in different increments. For instance, you could have it set to do every hour. You could set to do it every couple of days. It also takes a snapshot of let's say a month ago, just in case you realize, hey, my, one of my client's files was corrupt and I didn't realize it till today. Um, it gives you that ability to do that and restore back further than your local uh, backup would. Mm, so these are, you know, tra- traditionally a backup, we think of using a hard drive or in older days, a, a tape backup system that you'd take off site and maybe take to the bank or some other physical location that you felt was secure. This particular type of backup uses a combination of local hard drives, as well as cloud-based backup systems for your for your company. It also takes uh, uh, virtualization in, in the, into play where you could, in the event everything crashes, you can spin up a, a virtual environment of your server until you can get things back into place. So it, it pretty much limits you to almost no downtime in the event of a complete disaster. So there's a lot of these that you may recognize. We'll get some more details of each one of them. The last one on here is something that's a little more innovative, been around for a couple years, and in some ways it's been around longer. It's just recognized in a different different term right now. It's taking your whole office. And we'll give you an example of this, where you take your desktops and your servers, and you virtualize everything into the cloud or into a data center. And we'll give an example of that one as well. Let's talk about phones first, because that's uh, one that's been around a little bit longer, and one I'm a little closer to for our business. You know, we're we're a small, medium-sized business as well. Uh, and, it, and with that, we've had our own PBX systems. We've been around for 23 years, and we'd have to lease phone lines, lease phones, and lease a PBX. And once we had the opportunity to move into a voice over IP phone system, it really changed what we could do. It really had, had a really easy way for us to simply bring in a new type of phone, which we could buy. We didn't have to lease them anymore. Put, plug them into our uh, uh, internet access basically become a computer terminal um, and we can take this phone and use it anywhere in the office. It isn't tied even to the office anymore. Take these phones home with us, put them into an ethernet jack in our, our home and we can have access like it would be something we'd be right next to each other in the same building. Provides multiple, uh, mobility and there's a lot of cost savings for us to eliminate these you know, old in-house PBX systems out there. So if any small, medium-sized businesses are, you know, Still using PBXs and leasing lines, um, considering a voice over IP phone system is, is something really um, worth taking a look at. And actually, let's take a look, Pat. If, you know, we talk about remote users, mobile users. How do we use that system for ourselves in the past, this past winter? Yeah, at our help desk, uh, this is big for us. And obviously, this winter, it's already been a big help. Last winter as well, uh, we had the ability to take our phones home with us as soon as we uh, start seeing some snow coming down. We make, we make uh, you know, we, we talk with our team. We decide who's going to go home. We grab our phones and we just go and work. And you can pick up the phone. You can dial the extension uh, just like you would be in the office. So it, it makes it easy. You don't have to plan ahead. You can really just, 
uh, you know, when you see the, the weather storm coming in, you take your phone and you go home. Yeah, it's it's been, a, a, and again, this is cloud based. So the PBX, that old box that used to sit in the phone closet, now is essentially a cloud based or a server that takes and handles that processing somewhere else remotely in the data center we just described. So in our office, we have no more PBXs. All we have is just phones sitting at our desk that we can pick up and plug back into anyone's home internet line uh, with an ethernet jack, and we're good to go as we were in the office. Here we are today. And I think people hear that and they go, oh, this, this sounds expensive. But to be honest with you, I'm going to a customer, customer tomorrow using an old PBX phone, and they're going to cut their phone bill in half while getting you know much more flexibility and uh, better phones. Every Everything is going to be increase for less money, which is obviously a great thing to hear for them. So let's talk about <clears throat> another part of uh, file sharing, and one that's been a little more popular is, is cloud file sharing. The more popular one out there right now is Dropbox. It's known and, and widely used because of it's, it's so easy to use. I mean, it's one of the things that uh, I know people who are not technically savvy have, are using Dropbox, and it has its pros and cons with that because Dropbox has a free version. And I'll get into a whole series of, of suggestions for everyone, but it has some limited security. I know OneDrive, Google Drive are similar and are easy to work with. Um, it makes providing and sharing documents between either organizations or individuals very, very easy to do. The, the challenge is there are some security limitations on this. So one that I like to recommend that people evaluate, especially a lot of the accounting organizations, is ShareFile. So there's ways that you can share documents using Citrix ShareFile as a means to control access, maybe through passwords, a limited time they may have access to documents. You may get notifications when documents are shared back and forth. So one of the first, and I'll elaborate a little bit later at the end, is, is using cloud file sharing, which is great, but make sure you're paying for those services. Um, expecting to get a great service out of something that's free like in the free version of Dropbox, has a lot of limitations for you. And uh, I encourage you to evaluate the, the business version of Dropbox or something that's, I think, even more professional and, and for some environments is ShareFile from Citrix. Let's talk a little more about um, cloud applications. Again, because people are thinking, well, I don't use cloud services. I don't like cloud services. And, and really, like Dropbox, they're becoming more prevalent for us in a lot of different spots. So, Pat, what are some of the ones that, you know, you're working with accounts and customers on today? Yeah, I mean, the ones we see, I mean, obviously everyone uses Facebook, but uh, QuickBooks Online, we see uh, there's some Quicken. Um, there's a lot of different uh, portions of, of these very common applications that use a component that is technically cloud-based. It's storing your data off-site, even sometimes your, your standard uh, local copy of QuickBooks has the option there to do an online backup. And, you know, technically that is a cloud storage there. Um, so a lot of people say, hey, I don't, I don't like, I don't trust the cloud, but they don't realize they're already taking advantage of it. And is that one you just described, a QuickBook one? That, is, that with the, with the, is that a good one to be using? you feel it's secure? Yeah, I mean, we've hadn't, we haven't had any issues, and you know, our customers seem to like the ability to be able to, to have that extra assurance that their, their data is backed up off-site as well. Okay. Let's talk about one we, we highly recommend for a lot of organizations, uh, you know, and I'll let you elaborate a little bit more about Microsoft Office 365. Yeah, this is our, our go-to as far as email nowadays. Um, it, it allows a company to take their email server and basically toss it out. You don't need it anymore. It moves all your email off-site on, onto the uh, Microsoft Cloud through Office 365. Um, it gives you the ability to use the latest versions of Office. They give you five licenses. You can extend it to your, your PC at home, your Mac, your, your tablet. It also gives you some cloud storage and it gives you a 50 gigabyte mailbox, mailbox which then you don't have to worry about cleaning out old emails. It really allows you to, to not have to worry about that. That was kind of a big thing in the past is archiving all the time and deciding, hey, do I ever need to reference this? Um, with something like 365, you, you just don't have to worry about that. And then the pricing is great. It, it's competitive out there. There's some other services like Rackspace out there, but uh, Microsoft is definitely kind of leading the way right now. You know, the, I've, some statistics on this is the use of something like this is actually we're still relatively low. I know a lot of our customers are using it because we really promote it for them. But the idea that someone takes their mail system and, and, and basically moves it off to the cloud is still kind of foreign to some organizations, and there's still some people who are, a lot of people actually, who are hosting and managing their own mail servers in-house. 
And for all the reasons we described that that doesn't work out well and all the benefits we're trying to encourage people to evaluate, this is one of those ones that's it's a really a good one to consider evaluating because of all the extra features you get, plus the cost to become reduced for you in this manner. So let's talk about some of those reduced costs. Where do they fall into? The, the biggest one, I think, cloud services are providing re reduced capital costs. So we look at you know organizations that are spending money, whether it be an exchange server or a, some type of other specific business server, whether it be uh, for their uh, databases and things like that. Three to five years is typical life cycle. Five years can be pushing it because usually hardware is no longer maintained. Um, so you know, every three to five years, you're having to buy new servers. Along with that, it comes through backup devices. We're going to encourage folks to really understand their disaster recovery requirements at that point. And then, of course, there's the licensing fees that come along with that at all. Well, uh, along with that as well. And then, and oftentimes, we describe the backup scenario where sometimes there's people who are involved in the process inside an organization. You know, uh, Jim, who's in charge of uh, doing all your graphics work, is now also in charge of the, uh, the computers because he happens to be the smartest guy in the building and know how to deal with backups. Um, so it's time spent on these kind of technical duties that cloud services can offset and move off-site and uh, really reduce time as well as cost and having to deal with cloud ser uh, deal with services inside your own organization. So let's move over and talk a little bit more about evaluating some of these cloud services and what you want to look for. We've, we've talked about a few, the first one being compliance and standards. And uh, you know whether you look at anyone's organization, you want to dig a little deeper and find out what are the compliance and standards they're able to follow by their, their, the, uh, the, the back-end information they're hosting for you. Um, manage security access. Pat, you described some of that as well. What are some of the security things that you want to be thinking about when looking at a cloud service? Yeah, I think the big one is some kind of two-form authentication, which means, uh, for instance, the Dropbox has a, a feature of that where you have to type in a code on your phone if it connects from a new device. Let's say uh, you know, you're know you at a hotel or something like that. You'd have to put in a, a code on your phone. It's, it really just adds extra security layer, and it's something that you should con be definitely be considering on, on any of these cloud services is having that extra uh, functionality. Having a complex password these days just isn't isn't enough most of the time. Okay, so other things that, you know, when you're evaluating a cloud service for your organization is, is compatibility with the devices. For the most part, all devices are really compatible with that. You know, that's the, the benefit of cloud services that we enjoy and sharing with our customers. You can see it working with tablets, phones, <clears throat> traditional Windows computers, and Macintoshes now. Recovery options is an important aspect of this one. So when you have data out there, it, it's important to evaluate how to get that data back. If you don't want to use that service anymore, can you get that data back? You need to understand those kind of features and options when evaluating a cloud service. What do you? What can you do? How do you do it? Are there fees involved with that? And ultimately, you know, looking at what are the reduced costs, or there are other fees there for you to using the cloud services. And I think in most cases, if you look at the whole aspect of, of time and money and capital expenditures, you'll find most cloud services are going to reduce some costs for you in this manner. So let's start moving over to another area that we want to show kind of the, a more detailed kind of or expanded cloud offering that we're um, sharing with customers. It's, it's basically virtualizing an office. And a virtual office allows business owners and employees to work from any location by using technology for communication and information sharing. So we've had a lot of accounts uh, want to have some these capabilities that we've been talking about, things like device independence, you know, being able to use my MacBook being able to use my older Windows computers. Facility independence, meaning that, you know, I'm not tied to my office to do my work. I can be anywhere under any condition. I can get access whether I'm at the beach or whether I'm in my home. Disaster recovery. Uh, it's not just enough to have backup anymore. It's really truly having something that you know is being taken care of properly. And if you need to get back to that data, it's being taken care of in a, in a timely manner for you. And the other part about a virtual office is eliminating servers. And right now we we have a um, again I want to share with you because there's there's you can hear about this from other companies as well. Amazon's providing this. There's some other uh, Microsoft, but it's basically virtualizing your whole whole office. And Pat, do you want to describe kind of what happens in this process where we virtualize these components of an office and then allow someone to have access to them? Yeah, the the basic idea behind it is you're you're just eliminating all the equipment in your office. It's it's bringing it all kind of together in in one place. Um, 
For instance, we, we would go into an office and see what they have as far as servers, see what kind of applications they have. We then begin a, a migration process, putting them on these cloud servers, which um, uses what's called Microsoft Remote Terminal Services, which has been out there for years. So it's kind of leveraging new technology with proven technology in that terminal server environment. So that allows uh, staff to all, they can use any device they want, and they're all connecting up to the same terminal server or servers in this environment. And it makes it really easy to kind of leverage uh, things like updates and making sure everyone's uniform on the same versions of Outlook. Um, it, it kind of centralizes that and makes it very easy to do. Because yeah, we used to have that a lot for organizations. You have to run around to each computer one at a time and do an update. And we have a little, it's easier to manage that across the board for everyone at this point then. Correct. Let's jump into this. I'm going to quit out of the presentation I'm running right now and uh, show you my desktop computer. And I'm going to switch my screen. So bear with me a second here. Dave's actually using a MacBook Pro here. Dave's a Mac guy. Yeah, I've switched back and forth over the years on uh, enjoying my Macintosh, let's put it that way. So what I have down here below is uh, my applications that I run on my Macintosh. And one of the ones that I've installed on here is, and Pat, you want to describe this to everybody? Yeah, this is Mo Microsoft Remote Desktop. It comes uh, default on every PC. This uh, The Mac version is available in the App Store for free. It's really easy to download, really easy to use. And uh, Dave's going to connect up here to one of those cloud servers. So I'm, I'm in a, I'm on a Macintosh, and now you're seeing on your display is my Windows desktop. And Pat, you want to describe a little bit what, what we have going on here now? Yeah, this is, this is what I was describing. Uh, technically, Dave is connecting to a terminal server where, you know, we could have uh, up to, you know, hundreds of other people connected to this same uh, environment accessing the same data. Um, you have your own profile just like you would on the computer, but you also have your shared data. For instance, Dave right now is in a shared H drive. You know, maybe you have all your company data in there. Um, Dave can make edits here in a document just like you would on his local machine. So there's, there's really no uh, learning curve for someone to get into an environment like this, which makes it obviously much, much um, better for the uh, end user. And, and Pat, so someone using this, it kind of looks like the same computer they already had before. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I mean that's and the thing is, it's it's not just a, an overlay on top of something else. You are technically running the same uh, the same software you would be locally. Um. So what what kind of computer? So what other kind of computers can run this? For example, we'll, we'll give some examples. But sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing with something like this is you're leveraging that server that you're connecting to. You're leveraging the hardware on that end. So it, it kind of gives you a little more flexibility as far as what you're connecting with. Um, I've connected up with a 10-year-old laptop and run the cloud fine just like this. Um, we can connect up with an XP machine. We don't recommend it because it's, it's not uh, in service anymore. But it allows you to use older machines. It allows you to use any type of machine. We can connect up with a Linux machine. You can connect up with a Mac, a PC, tablet. Uh, Dave will do a little demo here. Let's do the tablet, for example. So I have Excel up and running. One of the, the beauties of this is creates a session. And I'm going to quit out of my session right here now. And if you'll bear with me a second, I'm going to uh, launch a utility that lets me uh, display my iPad. And this is great because it gives, um, for instance, right now, let's, let's assume that Dave had to run out. He was in the middle of a typing an Excel document. He got a phone call. He had to head home. Um, something in this environment that the session stays open. Dave could run home or even, you know, at Starbucks if he needed to. He could run to his, to his iPad and then he can, can connect up and pick up right just where he was. It keeps the session open and it keeps everything he had open unless he, he decides to close it out. So this is my iPad that I use at home and um, I brought it in for purposes here and Pat and I worked on making sure we had the one client, which is the RD client, which is essentially the same client I'm using on my Macintosh where I have my Windows. It was free, and uh, I launched it over here. I have my desktop, and it now is reaching out across the Internet. I'm using my Internet connection here wirelessly through the office and going to our cloud server uh, to get access to this desktop. Um, one of the folks in the office likes to use it on his iPhone, that's a little bit small for my my vision, the, the screen. But essentially, here's the same exact session I was running a minute ago. So I had Excel spreadsheet up and running. 
I had some numbers I was running in there. Um, all this is, is the same exact uh, information that I have in there for myself. And there's my pointer. Um, I can close out of here. And that's, that's definitely one of the big um, questions we get a lot of people asking. They'll say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to get an iPad. Is that something you'd recommend for business? And, and for the most part, they have gotten better, but you don't get the full desktop experience. So this gives you that ability to kind of use it as you would, just like you would on your desk, um, especially if you, if you pair a um, keyboard with it. I mean, it, there's really no difference. You're, you're operating Windows uh, 7 here, and it looks exactly what you're used to on your desktop. Yeah, so right here, again, these are the same applications I was running just a moment ago. And um, and the, one of the questions we get is, you know, how, how is this, you know, I've used something like LogMeIn. Is, is this the same thing? And the answer is, is really no. It, it gives you much quicker speeds. Um, it's, a, it's a lot easier to use than something like LogMeIn. And there's more of a, a centralized way of doing it. A lot of times, you know, there's a different component you may need it on one computer than you would need on another one. I would say like on an iPad, you know, they have those optional uh, keyboards that you can set up and, and that would be a little more conducive to working with something like this, but it does work. I'm going to quit my session out of here. And Pat, I'm actually going to throw the controls over to you. You're running what type of computer? This is actually a Microsoft uh, Surface. It's a pretty um, pretty good option that Microsoft uh, puts out there. It's, it's kind of a, a mix between like an iPad and a regular desktop. So it has a tablet portion, but as well as a full keyboard. And what we're going to simulate here is an, another way of accessing that cloud. Because you may say, hey, I don't, I don't have that, that, or that remote desktop client. Or let's say I'm going over to a family member's house. They don't have it. I, I need to use their computer to get to the cloud. This is a good way of doing that. What you could do is they could, uh, you could hop on someone else's computer. Let's say you're going to a client, you want to show them something. You could just say, hey, let me hop on your computer. You can go to the a browser. This is actually running the newest uh, browser by Microsoft. There wasn't any special configuration or anything needed to do it. And we're going to log in here with our account. Now, is there any trade-offs by using a browser as opposed to the application? Um, there, re there really isn't. There's a couple extra features you would get out of the full download, um, but... This is really this is really a great option when you're kind of in a pinch. Um, otherwise, you'd want to install the full client on on your uh, your main machines. So here we're back to right where we were. We have everything that that Dave had open. We have the Excel spreadsheet. This is on a completely different computer. So you know, even if let's say there was a huge power outage in the office, um, we could have run home here, hopped on, and picked right back up where you are. No data loss, nothing there. Yeah. Um, what kind of controls? I mean, I think one of the things that we talked about in cloud services is, is restricting or controlling. Can you restrict what people can do, have access to? You talk about running from home, things like that. Yeah, there's, there's a, it's the same way it would be in a normal environment where you can have special permissions on a folder. For instance, here we'll go to, um, under my computer, we're going to go to the uh, H drive. Let's say uh, Jill folder. You don't want someone to access that. It's very easy to do. Um, we, can, we can actually give a company owner or like an administrator the ability to do that themselves. Um, in the event, let's say an employee leaves, they can go in and, and kind of reset a password on their own. Extremely easy. That's, that's the good thing about an environment like this. It's, it kind of simplifies everything. Instead of having to go in and have someone hop on a server physically, know all the credentials there, you can kind of give someone that ability to do it um, and kind of leverage their own uh, their own office a little more. Okay. How about like uh, flash drives, things like that? We've had some requests to control or manage what kind of, you know, not just on H drives, but you know, devices on the computer itself. Yeah, we can block access or we can allow access to that. Um, you can block access from being able to move anything inside or outside of this environment. Uh, you know, by default, we could have it set where, let's say, Dave, you have a, a icon on your Mac that you want to put in the cloud. You can just copy and paste it, and it'll physically move it into the into the cloud environment where it's backed up, it's stored, and you know it's secure. Um, that's that's something that a lot of people take for granted. They may say, "Hey, I I have all this stuff saved on my computer; it's fine." In the event your computer crashes, you 
that data is gone. There's, you know, there's, there's ways to recover it. They can become very pricey and, and sometimes it's just not recoverable. So having it in an environment like this gives you that extra assurance that it's backed up and it's, it's able to be restored and, and restored quickly is, is the main, uh, main point. Okay, great. I'm going to take controls back again, Pat. And there I go, back to Baltimore. Um, and I'll bring up the presentation again. And give me one moment here. Okay, back up and running again. There we go. Um, so let's move over to uh, some of the features we talk about in this, if, if we haven't already covered them. So hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate to you it works on any device. We showed iPads. And, then, and again, we're demonstrating our solution here. There's other solutions are, that are, are becoming available from Microsoft and other organizations. Of course, we think ours is best, but um, I think that we want to make, make you aware that there are some really important innovations that are happening with technology and what we're sharing with you. you know, virtualizing your desktop and your servers uh, in an environment has a lot of benefits. So, Pat, what about printers? How, does that, how would that work in something like this? Yeah, and in our environment, um, they just t it takes whatever, whatever printers you already have on that computer and it redirects them into the cloud. So you can go in that cloud environment, you could hit print, and you'll see your printer selected there. Um, there's actually a, a pretty cool service out there uh, called Google Cloud Print. This allows you to print to your office from home. Uh, it's really easy to use if anyone wants to look into that. It's, it's a pretty uh, cool service. It's free from Google. You can point to your, you know, your printer in the office and, and print something there. So if someone says, hey, I need, I need this report printed out, you can, um, you can do that there. Cool. Let's talk about these data centers because that's really an important um, fundamental aspect of this since the, the data is no longer residing locally, it's remote. How, how do data centers and what we describe in these servers, um, how does that work? What is the importance of having them in different locations and the locations? What are the best locations, for example? Sure. Yeah, that's that's something you may not think about. You may say, hey, it's I know it's in a secure building, but the, another question is, where is that building? What state is it in? Um, you know, is it is it in a hurricane alley? Is it in, you know, somewhere where there's a lot of earth, earthquakes? Um, these data centers are definitely strategically placed where there are very small chances of those natural disasters occurring. What's great as well is in the event of a natural disaster, your data is replicated. For instance, your, you know, your company usually connects to the data center in Michigan. Um, in the event there was something there, a major power, power outage, your data replicates to another data center in another state. Um, those, that's, it's kind of what we stressed all along is, you know, how long, how long would I be down if something happened? And with something like this, the answer is, is very, very, uh, very low. Um, trying to get that kind of uh, replication on your own just gets extremely expensive. Okay. Let's just review some of the benefits that we've talked about and then uh, try to cover a couple questions. So one of the, one of the most important things we take a, a look at is the increased mobility, and that covers a lot of different areas of no longer tethered or obligated to uh, an office or a device. Uh, we really like to think in this path just to describe this, the server environment, improve disaster recovery for an organization. Um, everything's being backed up there and replicated in more than just one data center, typically. Okay, we're looking at data centers in different states, for that matter, that provide duplicate the data and backup information and redundancy. Uh, reducing capital investments, again, no longer having to buy servers, um, especially if you're staffing up during certain seasonal times, you don't have to buy latest and greatest technologies. You can take and use older technologies to accomplish what needs to happen. Or if someone has their own technology, they can use their own at that point. We're increasing security for organizations because a lot of times it is difficult to invest and make sure and be knowledgeable in all aspects of security that's going on out there. Um, we're specializing in making sure that these environments are secure, and not only technically, but also physically. We focus on, on providing organizations, let them do their own, their, their, their core business competency. If you're a lawyer, follow and 
spend more time with your, your, your practice. If you're an accounting organization, you're not you're fuddling around with tape backups. Okay. The, the, the technology doesn't get in the way anymore. And most importantly, this type of system, and we haven't talked about that. We do have that as a question. How can you scale it? So if during, this, this is the actual question, you know, during tax season, how can you add users or turn them off and on? Pat, how does that work? Yeah, it makes it really easy to do that. You don't have to plan and say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to purchase a new laptop. What kind of, what kind of processor do I need? Are they gonna be a, a heavy user? Are they gonna be kind of just doing some light work on it?" Um, this gives you the ability to kind of just use whatever equipment you have. Um, if you have a, an older laptop in there, they could use that one, and they can connect up. It's very easy to to add and remove accounts, and in fact, you could have a new user set up within five to ten minutes instead of having to plan ahead days and potentially have them kind of sitting there at their desk waiting for, uh, you know, a password for email or waiting some for uh, an application to get installed. It kind of puts everyone on the same page where you have the ability to kind of manage them all in one spot. Yeah, here's another question that came in. Um, security is a big question, given all the news we constantly hear uh, about security and what's going on. And, and actually just to... Um, Share with we do a, a, a webinar every quarter on security, cyber related. Uh, some of it has to do with social engineering. So stay tuned for some of our uh, upcoming webinar announcements. I think our next one's going to be May 4th. But point being is that, you know, how can cloud services or how are they better from a security standpoint than what maybe someone's doing today? And, and we, we look at it a couple of different ways. We look at it the going back to the picture that, that we showed originally in the slide, a lot of organizations we run into physically do not have the security in place that a, that a, a cloud server or a data center that can do. You know, physical security, um, there's the updates that are being done. Most small businesses can't keep up with all the updates, nor know exactly which ones need to happen in which sequence and order, because um, there's constantly not just virus you know, updates, there's, there's operating system and application updates, and all these together make up for protection for a company and organization. And that's just from the server side, let alone trying to up, keep updates happening on the desktop side with operating system applications and other virus protection that's running there too. So it can be a little overwhelming for a small or medium-sized business to try to keep up with all those different technology updates that need to be going on pretty much weekly, if not daily in some cases, and what's happening. So we, we feel and know that uh, a cloud-based environment is more often going to be better than what somebody can do on their own is what it comes down to. Um, that's not to say that security issues don't happen in the cloud. Uh, quite honestly, they, they do. There isn't, there isn't an environment out there that's completely secure. I mean, we, that's why you hear about you know, organizations like Best Buy or you heard about um, the government you know, OPM got hacked. Any number of organizations get hacked, and they have a lot of great people helping them out. So some of these security uh, questions come out is, uh, where are you better off is what it comes down to. And can you provide the security locally for yourself, or can someone else help you do it better is what it comes down to. Let's talk about security, actually. Good lead in here. A, a few tips for uh, secure cloud file sharing. I know, again, a lot of people are using this. So I've mentioned this already. Um, one of the big ones is to pay, pay for upgraded features and don't use the free features you get maybe from drop, Dropbox. Um, one of the options in some of these services like ShareFile or Dropbox, you can set expiration dates to either folders or documents that you're providing and sharing that they data to other people. Set an expiration date. Don't leave it open-ended as they can have access to this for an unlimited amount of time. You can assign passwords. You can make them complex if you wanted to. You want to set permissions so some people can only read the information. They can't add documents or make changes to it. When you are using passwords, make sure they're long and complex, not just something such as silly as Donald Duck. Make it you know something that people wouldn't recognize. Um, and I also recommend using unique site passwords, meaning what you use for Facebook, you don't use for your office or your banking. Pat mentioned the two-factor authentication, which is becoming more widely accepted and used across all areas. I, my 401k plan, my bank, uh, my credit union are all requiring me to use two-factor authentication with my cell phone and take advantage of that. And if it's an option, turn it on. If you're if you're not familiar with it, investigate a little bit further. It provides that third layer. It says two-factor. It's actually a third layer of authentication to get to controlling security for sharing information and documents. And also, make sure your devices, such as your PCs, your, your phones, and your laptops, and your um, tablets, have security turned on as well. And what I mean by that is, after a certain period of time, they go to sleep and they're locked. 
Okay, don't leave them open that someone could pick up and get access to the information from there. So I have another question for us. Um, one of the things we didn't demonstrate on this, I'll go to our questions and answer. Uh, we answered a few already, but um, one of the questions, Pat, was how many displays can we um, we provide in a situation with the demonstration we have with the Ease Cloud workspace? Sure. Yeah, the demonstration we, we did, uh, you can have, uh, I think we've actually seen someone have up to seven monitors. And there's there's no extra configuration needed for that. You just connect up. It takes whatever you have already connected to your computer and stretches it across those or actually creates the different screens just like you would if you had the desk right in front of you. Um, so there's there's really no limitation we've seen unless you're, you're using uh, 15 monitors, which <laughs> I'm sure there's probably a way we could get it to work anyway. Yeah, and the same, it works the same way on the Macintosh as well. So I have a Macintosh with a second display. I launch my cloud desktop and it displays two displays in Windows for me at that point right, right away. Yeah, I think the thing that's stress with that is some people may say, hey, you know, I have a really unique setup, but with, with all these things that we talk about, it's really simple to do. There's really no extra configuration needed. Um, it, 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 cloud's kind of already, it already knows what you, what most people, you know, use in their office from day to day, in, in their day to day lives. So it, it already has all those features kind of built in. Okay. Um, to wrap things up, um, many of you using, are using cloud services already. Um, we encourage using cloud services wisely with some of the suggestions and ideas we've shared with you about knowing more about security and, and questions you can ask of cloud service providers. And if we can help you out with any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Again, um, my name I'm Dave Kyle. I, I'm at Ease Technologies. We've been around since 1993 here in Columbia, Maryland. We provide IT services and cloud solutions. And we'd love to help you out and, and answer any questions. So, again, I want to thank you very much. Pat, thanks for joining me today. Sure, thanks, thanks everyone. And we'd like to thank everyone here as well for joining.